Welcome to Zeek in Action. Today we'll be taking a look at our first packet capture and the data that Zeek and incidentally Suricata will deliver about this network activity. My name is Richard Baitlick and if you are new to the Zeek in Action video series, please take a look at the introduction to Zeek in Action video that I recorded previously that shows how to set up the BRIM software that we'll be using and also talks a little bit about Zeek itself, uh, the Wireshark project that we'll be using for taking a look at some of the traffic as well as the source for the packet captures we'll be looking at. Today's analysis will take a look at a case that Mr. Brad Duncan provided on his malware traffic analysis.net website. We'll be looking at one of his older traffic analysis exercises, specifically the one from 2015, February 8th. This scenario is called Mike's computer is acting weird. And Mr. Duncan provides us with a zipped PCAP file. And we'll be downloading that in a moment. The scenario that is at hand is the following. Mike calls the help desk and says his desktop computer is, quote, acting weird, but he refuses to provide any details. The help desk reports it to your organization's Security Operations Center, or SOC. A phone call to Mike doesn't reveal any details. He insists his computer is acting weird, but will not say what exactly is wrong. One of the SOC analysis searched through network traffic and retrieved a PCAP related to this activity. This traffic occurred shortly before Mike called the help desk. This is actually amazing. Uh, the fact that you would have this data is very, very helpful. Uh, the analyst cannot figure out what happened, so you've been asked to take a look. You review the PCAP and take notes. First, you document the following. Date and time of the activity, the IP address of Mike's desktop computer, the host name of Mike's desktop computer, and the MAC address of Mike's desktop computer. Based on the traffic, what happened? That is the question we will be trying to answer by taking a look at the PCAP today. So we will start by downloading this PCAP. Not very large. Let's go ahead and open it. We'll extract it all. It asks for a password. The password is infected. And there we are, there is our PCAP. Now, I know many of you out there, the first thing you do when you see a PCAP is you open it in Wireshark. Well, we're not gonna be doing that today, at least not straight away. One of the goals of the Zeek in Action series is to provide you a different way of looking at network traffic. And while a packet by packet analysis that can be provided by a tool like Wireshark has its merits, when you're trying to figure out what's happening on a bigger scale, there are other data sources that you may want to consider. Remember, when you're conducting network security monitoring, there are four legs to the table or four pillars to the building. You have the full packet capture, which we have now on our hard drive. You have extracted file data, meaning if someone transfers a, an executable and you extract that executable from the traffic, that's the second form of NSM data. But beyond the packets and the, the file contents, you also have transaction logs, and that's what Zeek can provide you. And you have IDS alerts or judgments about what potentially could have happened. That's something else we'll be uh, uh, using in this video. Well, how do we get started? First, let's use Brim. And we're going to import the PCAP that we just downloaded. So we'll say, in fact, we can just drag it and drop it. Let's do that. Make sure you drag and drop into the square where it says drag and drop. Now, as we wait, and we won't wait very long, Brim is processing that PCAP using Zeek and it is processing the PCAP using Suricata. So we're going to be getting two of the 
four forms of network security monitoring data available through the BRIM interface. We have the PCAP itself. We could look at that in Wireshark. Uh, as far as extracted file contents, if we wanted to take a look at that, the easiest way probably to get it using the setup we have here would be to find the conversation of interest in Wireshark and then uh, rebuild the session, which we may do if that is something we need to do to figure out what's happening in this event. Let's take a quick look at what we have to work with now that this trace has been processed by BRIM. BRIM appears uh, to show various types of logs in a tabular format. And there's a variety of logs that it will present to you. These are a combination of logs that were created by Zeek and logs that were created by Suricata. The Suricata logs are probably the easiest ones to identify. Those are the ones that have this red alert assigned to them. Everything else, uh, is, at least as, as far as I understand it, is generated by Zeek. So if we just take a quick scroll through here, the first thing that you're going to rec probably notice, or one of the things that I notice right away, is that the time sequence goes from the most recent activity to the oldest activity. And I am not necessarily a fan of that view. So let's see what we can do to change that. I'm going to right click on the time field and I'm going to change the uh, sorting. So I just changed the sorting and now I have the oldest event at the top and the newest event is at the bottom. Newest event right down there. So let's go back up to the top. Okay. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at this activity overview. This is a set of pre-canned queries that the BRIM team has created to describe the data that you'll find in the tr a trace. Uh, remember, BRIM can process PCAPs to create logs, as we have here, or you can import Zeek logs. So if you happen to use open source Zeek, you generate logs and you put them on a hard drive, you can import those logs into BRIM and review them. Um, but I like being able to process a PCAP using BRIM like this because not only do you get the Zeek logs as produced by BRIM, but we also get the Suricata events and they're natively seen here in the BRIM interface. Uh, and we can also pivot to the packets, which may be something we would want to do a little bit later. But uh, this activity overview gives us a summary of the number of logs that were generated for each type. So you can see there were 73 connection logs, 43 DNS logs, 24 file logs, and so forth. Um, notice that it doesn't show the alerts. So that's just something to keep in mind. I'm going to take a look at the uh, Suricata alerts by source and destination, just as one way to begin our exploration. Um, now, there are many different ways that you could investigate activity. Everyone probably has their own workflow, and that is one of the goals of the Zeek in Action video series, is to uh, show different types of workflows. I'm going to be showing a workflow today that is based around uh, a SOC analyst, at least uh, my rendition for today of a SOC analyst. And there are other ways you could take a look at this data. For example, you could take a look at a trace completely cold. Uh, by that, I mean someone could give you a trace and say, find out if there's anything suspicious or malicious in this, in this trace. Uh, in my consulting days, I had situations like that, and I developed a methodology around looking at that uh, data. Uh, so maybe, maybe at some point we will go through that in a Zeek in Action video. Uh, but today I decided to use the setup that Mr. Duncan provided because it's 
reflective of what ha happens uh, in the real world. And because we're doing that, and we do have access to both Zeek data and uh, Suricata data, one of the values of having both of those types of network security monitoring data available is that you can use the strengths of each one. So we already heard uh, in this case that we have a user who reported something about their desktop acting weird. And if we have Suricata events, we may be able to get a hint as to what weird could be. Now, that doesn't mean that Suricata or any intrusion detection engine will be able to find what's happening uh, or that any method potentially could find what's happening. You may have to do a bunch of in-depth personalized analysis in order to find what weird means. But if you've got a resource like a Suricata alert, why not take a look at it and see what you have to work with. So the first thing I, I notice here are the IP addresses uh, that are in play. And as I take a look at them, I'm actually grabbing a notepad because I'm going to be making some notes. Uh, in fact, why don't I just do that right here for you as opposed to doing it on a piece of paper. I will actually bring up a notepad. So one of the tasks uh, or one of the methodologies I like to use is to keep notes as I am taking a look at a trace. Um, I don't even know what the IP address is of the victim in this case, or I should say the target or the person who's reporting the activity. However, when I take a look at the IP addresses in these uh, Suricata events, I notice that there is a 172.16 IP address that appears several times. Um, you may recognize the 172.16 address space as being part of the RFC 1918 private addresses that are reserved for uh, use behind network address translation. Uh, so I'm going to make a note of that. I'm betting that 172.16.137.40 is the workstation in question. Now when I take a look at what I'm seeing here, I see that we have uh, several unknown traffic alerts that have been generated. We have two, a network trojan was detected alerts that were generated. Uh, we have a generic protocol command decode alert. We have uh, and a couple of device retrieving external IP address detected alerts. So I find all of that interesting. So I'm going to make a note here and say possible network trojan. Now let's take a look and see if we can take a look at some of these guys. Let's do a, a pivot to logs and see what we have. So all I did there is I right clicked on uh, one of those alerts and said pivot to logs. And now we can see these are the Suricata alerts associated with that event. Um, remember we were looking at alert categories previously and now we're able to take a look at the specific alerts themselves. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to see if I can remove some of these fields because I don't particularly care about VLAN so I'm just going to make that a little bit smaller. Uh, alert severity I also do not care about. Um, let's see if we can make that desk port a little bit smaller. Okay. So we have, uh, based on these alert signatures, we're getting some actually pretty good information here. Um, let's take a look at what that means. So the, the Suricata engine is reporting that we have uh, ETJA3 hashes for possible malware uh, Drydex. Drydex is bad, so this could be the source of what's going on. So I'm going to make a note here of a possible Drydex compromise. All right. Now these are all possible. We don't know for sure that this is what's happening, but this is based on the JA3 hashes that are appearing in the uh, 
the uh, TLS connections between uh, 172.16, 137.40, and this destination IP address of 194.28.190.26. That's what we have uh, to take a look at. Now, I'm going to take a look at some of the other canned queries that we have here to see if they report anything that uh, is interesting. So I'm going to take a look at the unique uh, DNS queries and see if anything uh, catches my attention. Uh, some of these, here's the here's the check ip.dns.org. This is probably associated with those IDS alerts that we saw earlier. Uh, and incidentally, these are all being derived from uh, Zeek logs. So it doesn't look like a Zeek log because we're pulling out the uh, DNS element and just showing us what was queried, but this is all Zeek data. So none of this uh, necessarily jumps out at me and says, you know, this is, this is bad, look at this. That's one of the, the strengths actually of Zeek is that it's just keeping track of what's happening in your environment regardless of whether it's bad or not. And that's what helps you deal with intruders who are able to get around defenses that are based upon known bads. So this uh, Zeek data could be uh, potentially useful. Uh, I'm also going to take a look and see if I have any of these HTTP requests. And I have several coming from this uh, 172.16.137.40 system again. And, and notice that uh, we've we're taking advantage of the work that the Brim team did to create some custom queries for us that just pull out fields of interest. So for example, um, the host and the URI. Let's take a look at uh, file activity. And it looks like we don't have any files. Okay. And same thing, there are no HT post requests. No Windows networking activity to, to take a look at. Let's take a look at unique network connections. This is a summary of activity that was pulled from uh, the Zeek logs. And you can see we've got Let's just do this. Let's do a sort by the port. So when I take a look at this activity, um, just based on my my uh, <laughs> my recognition of what some of these port numbers mean, we see uh, 53 is DNS, uh, 67 is DHCP. We have port 80, so HTTP uh, not encrypted, most likely. Uh, 137 Windows networking, uh, 443. Those are those TLS connections we might have seen earlier. Uh, port 1900, that's some kind of UDP broadcast traffic. Uh, this activity on 3478, I don't know what that is. So that might be something of interest to take a look at. So let's make a note of that, 3478. Also, we have some 5355. This is probably some more local broadcast traffic. Um, then we have this interesting activity at 12101, 12103. And then we have these two involving 20208. So I think what I'd like to do there is maybe pivot to a couple of these and see what they look like. Let's see if I can do that. Let's go to uh, it looks like I can't pivot to those logs because this is uh, like a query result. But um, let me see if I can open detail. No, nothing to see with the open details. Let's go to, let's do a query with this value and see what we get. Okay, that's probably a little bit crude, but it is actually good enough. Um, ah, yes, okay. So this looks like we have, interesting. So I made a note of 3478 and 20, uh, 208 or 08. And this is probably associated with um, session traversal utilities for NAT, because we're getting uh, alerts from Suricata about that. 
And then we have, this is our first real Zeek log, um, where we have a con log entry for a UDP connection. Uh, it's kind of nice we have the community ID. Uh, the community ID is a, a fairly recent, within the last few years, addition to several open source projects. It is a hash of uh, the source IP source port, dust IP dust port, and protocol that can be computed by multiple applications at the same time and then shared as a way to refer to a conversation. So for example, Suricata can calculate this community ID value. Zeek can communicate or can calculate the same community ID value. And then when you're trying to find connections that have both of them, you have that uh, way to do a query as opposed to querying on IPs or times or ports and so forth. So if I were to actually do a query on that value, notice I get the same connections that I had before. And that's because uh, the community ID value is embedded in, in both of these. In fact, I should be able to find it if I look along. Yeah, there it is. There's the community ID value embedded in these two Suricata events. And here we have the community ID value in this part of the uh, Z connection log. Um, let's just take a look at the details of this um, log entry just to get to give a, a better a um, little more attention to what Zeek logs look like. So you see we have a timestamp, we have a UID that's computed by Zeek, then we have the source IP, source port, dest IP, dest port, and the protocol. We have duration, we have byte and packet counts, and this as a UDP connection um, we don't really know anything more about it. Now, I have to say, this is one of the cooler things about Brim. I mean, there's a lot of cool things about Brim, but uh, notice what it does down here. It gives you this little connection history. It gives you some correlation between the connection and these alerts that we received. Um, this is all pretty cool, I think. Okay. So that was just sort of a little bit of a dive on, uh, on a session traversal utilities. I don't know if this has anything to do with our bad guy or not. Uh, one thing I might do though is let's go ahead and query on that dest IP and see if that tells us anything. We'll do a new search on value. Let's see if we got anything. Um, same two alerts. We have the UDP connections and we have a DNS request for a stun.internetcalls.com. So this might be having something to do with a uh, potentially using NAT traversal in order to set up a call of some type. But this is probably not something that we're that interested in. So I'm gonna go backwards through our results. And let's take a look at this activity use involving 12101. Let's see what we have there. So I'm just gonna do another sort of um, hacky query and just query on the port in involved and see what we get. Here we have two uh, Zeek connection logs and I'm going to show the details on those. And this is apparently all that we have. Um, so this might be a good uh, time to pivot to the PCAP perhaps and see what that might look like. So I'm going to uh, let's see, download PCAPs. And that opens it up in Wireshark. Now this is really interesting. Uh, all we have apparently is a SYN packet, or I should say a, uh, a, TCP, a, SYN, a SYN TCP segment, if we want to be very accurate about what we're saying. Literally that's it, that's all we have down there. Now, let's go back into the details here of the Zeek data. And what I'm looking for is the history field. There it is right there, history. The history just says a capital S, meaning just a sin was sent. So if I had been a little sharper and I decided to take a look at that first, I would have known that if I were to pull up the trace, it would only be a, a sin TCP segment, and sure enough, that's what we had. So when you see something like that, uh, you know you've got 
not a lot to work with, which is what we saw when we took a look at the, uh, the Wireshark events. In fact, here's the const state here showing that just a sin was sent, S0. So there's really not a lot to look at there. Let's take a look at this uh, 103. And you'll notice we have the same, actually. Just go ahead and take a look at the history. So just more SYN traffic. So it looks to me like all the action that we're going to be getting is involving um, other ports that are normal activity, uh, normal huh, per se. Um, one of the lessons or one of the um, approaches I like to use when I'm looking at a trace and just being asked, so what is unusual about this trace, is uh, in addition to taking a look at the IDS alerts, I also like to take a look at any clear text traffic to see if that might tell me something about what's happening. So let's take a look at these HTTP requests. Um, and we're going to, let's see if I can actually um, open the details. That just shows me the details I have there. Let's try this. Yeah, this is one of the issues. When you're taking a look at a query result like this, you don't have the full log. So I'm going to go back into the um, activity overview, and I'm going to go to the HTTP.logs, and I'm going to pivot to the logs. So now I have access to the full HTTP logs as generated by Zeek. And now I can take a look at any one of these if I want. Um, just for the d purposes of demonstrating what I mean by looking at the uh, raw text of something, let's take a look at this request for checkip.dyndns.org. And I'm going to... Uh, well, that's interesting. Um, hmm. Now that's interesting that I can't download the PCAP from there. Let's see, let's try this. Okay, I just clicked on the packets at the top instead of uh, trying to, to download PCAPs. So let's just try using that in the future. Not sure why I wasn't able to do that. Um, this is not the one I was interested in. This is uh, pulling down this uh, MS, MS download update. Not really what I care about, so I'm going to close that. And we're going to come back down here to the checkip.dyndns.org. Click packets. See what we get. Okay. Um, and I'm going to right click here and I'm going to say follow the TCP stream. And now we have a visual representation of the traffic that was exchanged, the, uh, the payloads that was, they were exchanged between the source and the desk. And we can see here that we had a get request for the checkip.dyndns.org site. Uh, that's the red that came from the client. The server responded with a HTTP 1.1 200 OK message. Uh, and it's reporting that the IP address that it was that it saw was 212.38.170.7. Now you might be wondering, well, wait a second. I thought I was working with 172.16.137.40 as my workstation in, que in question. And in fact, if you take a look at the uh, source IP here, that is the IP address you see. Well, let's remember how a site like uh, checkip.dyndns.org actually works. It is taking a look at the traffic that it sees as it comes over the internet. So you're not going to be able to route traffic with an RFC 19 address like 172.16.137.40. Uh, that traffic won't route. In fact, if it ends up at your your destination, then something odd is, is occurring. Uh, or at least you won't be able to respond to it. At least you shouldn't. Uh, there's always weird things occurring with internet routing. But what we understand now is that the public IP address of the network in question is uh, 212.38.170.7. So I'm going to make a note of that. I don't know if that'll be necessary to know later, but that is my public address. 
All right. I should probably save this. All right. Close that. Close that. Okay. Now, now let's go back to just taking a look at the Zeek logs uh, as they exist on the system. What is a good way to get to that? Well, one way to do it would be just be to get rid of the query. Okay. And to go back to sorting like that. Okay, so now we're back to taking a look at the activity uh, from oldest to newest, from top to bottom. And something I might want to try is just taking a look at uh, some of these con logs. So let's do that. That's not probably the best way to do that. Okay, there we go. That's a better way to take a look at the con logs. Um, this trace isn't very long. In fact, um, you know, you're looking at dozens of con log entries. Um, this is sort of the difference between taking a look at a trace that is in Zeek con log or Zeek transaction log format versus something in uh, PCAP format. Um, as a matter of fact, why don't we do that just to show you the difference what we're taking a look at here. So you can see these are all of the con log entries. In other words, this is a summary of all the activity that's occurring in this trace. If we were to take a look at the equivalent in uh, Wireshark, um, let's go ahead and just open it up in Wireshark so you can get a sense of what we're looking at. This is what a lot of people sort of have been taught to do over the years is just to open up something in Wireshark. And as you can see, there's way more data here, all of this data. And this is what one of the values of Zeek is, is that it, it collapses all of this activity, especially like these TCP sessions that we have here. All of these TCP sessions will get reduced, or each individual TCP session will get reduced down to uh, a single con log entry. And as a result of that, you have much less data to look at. So that when you find something of interest that you want to um, take a quick look at, then you can just burrow into it, either looking at the Zeek logs, you know, more, more Zeek logs, or you can take a look at um, the packets if you are so inclined. Now I'm just going to sort of scroll through here and see if anything catches my attention. So for example, we've got, this is all DHCP activity, some type of multicast DNS or something like that, um, more broadcast activity, DHCP, Windows networking, uh, multicast DNS, DNS, and our first activity that is kind of, in, of interest is when you have this um, port 80 activity which incidentally is followed by the, the, <coughs> these uh, SYN requests that we saw earlier. And then we've got more DNS, more HTTP. And a ton of TLS traffic down here. And if you recall, the TLS traffic that we saw was associated with the JA3 of a Drydex server. Um, maybe we should say just a, a little bit about JA3. Um, JA3 is an awesome project, open source, part of Zeek. And what it does is it computes a hash based on the characteristics of the ciphers that are presented by a server, or in some cases, if you have it so configured by a client. Um, and if you have 
a JE3 that has been identified as being associated with a malicious server, like a Drydex server, then you can potentially flag that. And that's what happened when we saw those alerts uh, that occurred earlier. So we already noticed that these TLS activities were associated with uh, Drydex. In fact, let's go ahead and just grab one of these and see what we have. Um, in fact, let's do, just pivoted there. So what I did was I pivoted on the uh, con log value. Actually, I wanna pivot on the community ID if I can find it. Um, Actually, you know what? I'm going to start earlier with this TLS connection. And let's see if I can find the community ID. There it is. Let's pivot to that. Okay. So this could be the beginning of our problems. This is the con log entry that I just looked at. And here is a, an associated uh, Suricata alert for the JE3 hash being uh, possible malware. You know what, I'm going to, ah, okay, let's actually pivot into these details because I think we just found something interesting. So if I look at the details for this connection over here, um, you'll see that we've got some data that was transferred over SSL uh, but the thing that caught my attention was um, uh, Brim is using a library to provide you with geolocation details. And it looks like we're dealing with a Russian country code with KHM as the region um, and Surgut as the city. Now, we really don't know uh, if this is truly the case, this could just simply have been a proxy through which the last, you know, this is the last end of the chain that is connecting to our system or our system is connecting to it. Uh, but uh, the fact that uh, we do have this uh, JE3 hash for a possible Dradex server, it's located in Russia. Um, not that there's anything inherently wrong with Russia, but this might be a little bit suspicious if uh, browsing to a website or browsing to a TLS enabled site uh, in Russia is outside of the general activity that Mike uh, might be using his computer for. Um, notice the correlation that we have here through Brim is really nice where we have the con log, we have an SSL entry, we do have a files entry, then we have alert and a notice. Uh, in fact, if we take a look at the notice that we have here, we have a, a self-signed certificate with an email address of uh, sampo at iki.fi. Um, you know, again, I don't know if any of this is a problem, but I'm going to make a note of this activity here and say that uh, 31.163.203.92 since Sir Good are you. Um, let me just do a quick pivot on that desk IP and see if we have anything else. Um, We have the same, uh, this is a Zeek notice for a self-signed certificate. We just took a look at that previously. We have this Suricata alert. Uh, we do have a file that was, uh, this is based on the certificate and we can probably take a look at that if we want. Um, open the details on that guy. Here's our certificate information. Do the same thing for the uh, Oops, we'll do the same thing for the SSL. Self-signed certificate there. Here's our J3 hash. Uh, here's the server hash. This is what was used for um, the Drydex identification. The J3 is the client side hash. So this would be uh, Mike's computer, or at least the software on Mike's computer that's doing this activity. Okay, so this is interesting to me, it seems like we have the activity that occurred uh, right about here. This seems to be the beginning of our issues. 
Um, I'm going to just sort of make a mental note of that. And I'm going to go back to our Zeek logs. See if I can find that. So here's our alerts. Dynamics. Actually, let me go forward. What's the time on that? The time is eighteen thirty-two seventeen. Eighteen thirty-two seventeen is here. Boom. So there's our con log. There's our SSL, X509, the file. Here's our alert on the GA3. Um, okay. Now, one of the questions I have is how did this happen? We have this, uh, we'll call this a malicious connection right here. This one, this uh, connection to 31.163.203.92. I'm going to try to do is go backwards in time and see if we can find anything that would tell me why we ended up or why Mike's p PC ended up going there. Um, Makes me wonder if potentially we need to take a look at some of these earlier HTTP connections and see if something was downloaded. Um, so here we have a connection that is interesting. Um, notice we've got that Russian geolocation again. This is these are the SYN connections we saw earlier. So we've got these. TCP uh, connection attempts to Russian sites. So that's not good either. Again, it just seems to be correlated with uh, odd activity that we saw previously. So I'm going to keep going backwards in time and see what we see. Let's see if we can rebuild some of these TCP connections and see if there might be anything of interest there. And then we just have these downloads for these JPEGs, or at least it says it's a JPEG. I mean, who knows what it is really. Yeah, we have these get requests for these tux, toxic oost, <laughs> toxic oustic arrow u dot jpeg with no reply. So that's weird. I don't like that. Um, yeah, if we go farther back in this activity as well, we're seeing these. Uh, other alerts, these ET malware U Pater external IP check. Let's see how far back do we have to go before we see something that's clearly bad? So the first sign that we get of something that is odd is a query to a uh, something that's hosted at dyndns.org. And then we start seeing uh, these alerts here. These are higher severity, apparently, because they're orange. Love those colors. That's that's for you, Bam Vischer, and all the squeal users out there. Um, yeah. 
So the question is, how did he get to this? Pro how did he get to this point? What happened to Mike? Let's take a look at this one. Yeah, these are these are DNS check-in or uh, IP checks. What happened to you, Mike? That is what we're trying to find out. I hope it's not something as simple as, well, Mike just brought in his PC and it had malware on it. That would be really lame. I really hope it's not as simple as that. It is possible. It's possible that he came to work with his computer and uh, that's what we have to work with. But I really would like to see something that shows some type of um, compromise vector. Right, like this is what happened to this dude. Let's see here. Go back into my con logs. So what I'm looking here is seeing, you know, DNS uh, DNS can be used to transfer acti transfer traffic other than um, just doing lookups. It can be used as a covert channel. So I don't want to dismiss that out of hand, although I kind of am in this case. What I'm looking at is, uh, and again, DHCP is used for uh, obtaining IP addresses. Um, again, it could be used for a covert channel, but I'm kind of dismissing that. Um, right now as well. So when I see all this activity of DHCP, DNS, DHCP, DNS, 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 um, I'm trying to look for some type of a connection where you've got a real transfer of data, not simply uh, network house pe housekeeping type activity. And the first activity that I see that is, uh, that is something where data could be transferred and data was transferred um, is, is this one here. And this one was a this get request that we saw for uh, an IP address check. So okay, that's not something someone does every day, um, but you know it is what it is. But it's it's not like somebody got compromised using that though. Uh, and then we do have these requests for SYN traffic going out to these sites in Russia, but if that's the case, then that system was previously compromised. Uh, in other words, looking at the connection logs we have here, there's no previous activity that would indicate here is how this system became compromised. Um, we simply have DHCP, DNS, we have an HTTP lookup for an IP address, uh, or to, to find out someone's IP address, and then we start having at 183100 um, and uh, 0.675 and also at point, uh, 0.688, we start getting these SYN requests out to these Russian sites. So I don't think we have the information we need in this case to determine how Mike's computer was compromised. We can say that it appears to be compromised because he's visiting uh, these servers that are matching JA3s of Drydex, but we don't have the initial compromise vector, which is a little disappointing, but this is what we have to work with. So if I were to answer what is going on with Mike, I would say that he has a system that is compromised with malware that is trying to reach out to Russian websites. Now let's, let's find out if he actually did um, make any connections out to other, uh, other uh, sites. We have this is interesting here. I just scrolled down and saw that these TCP connections that are um, in play are going out to Poland, France. Uh, there's our, our Russian uh, connection we saw earlier. Now, 
uh, you might say, well, why don't I just drill into some of this uh, TLS activity and find out what it looks like? Well, let's, let's do that just so you can see what we have to work with. This TLS activity is um, is encrypted, so we're not going to be able to make sense of it. The, the clear text that we can see in here is based on the certificates that are involved, so that has to be clear text, at least with this version of TLS, um, but we don't have more beyond that. In fact, all of this SSL, you'll see it here, SSL, SSL, um, that's what we have to work with. I'm going to take a look at that and see what we have there. Uh, let's follow along here. Yeah, this looks like this download.windowsupdate.com download of a uh, auth roots cab file. Can't make sense of it, at least as we're looking at it there. Let's see if there might be any other clear text that we could see. Doesn't really look like we have anything. You'll notice that we've got uh, you know no no bytes to work with. We don't really have anything. And just to just to validate that, it's probably just going to be another sin packet. Yeah, there we go. Or oh, actually, these are reset acts. Just to make a note about the encrypted traffic. This is one of the frustrations you can have when you're trying to use purely network-based evidence to solve a case. Um, if you don't have a means of uh, man in the middle, you can't actually see the raw traffic that is available. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't other sources of data you can look at. Um, maybe we'll, we'll share that uh, for another, another time. Uh, but the GA3 data was one example of something that you could, you could take a look at even though it's encrypted or even though the session itself was encrypted, the JA3 data was very useful. All right, well, we've gone for quite a while now, and what we've determined is that uh, Mike's computer is this 172.16.137.40 workstation, and it appears that he, he brought his computer to work uh, with a Drydex compromise, or uh, if it is a work computer that is um, perhaps on site all the time, the traffic that was captured does not show how that system became compromised. We simply have the evidence of this system performing various reaches out to um, uh, shady web properties or shady servers that appear to be hosting uh, Drydex based on the JA3 server side uh, hash that is presented. Um, we found out that some of those servers are uh, in Russia, Poland, France, apparently. Um, we do have the public IP address of our network, if that is of, of any use. So clearly there is uh, a problem here, and we have helped confirm that that is the case. Uh, to do that, we used Zeek logs through Brim, we used alert data from Suricata through Brim, and we used Wireshark to take a look at some of the details, uh, not necessarily so much at the packet level, but the reconstruction to show the, um, the session or the transcript of what was available. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, stay tuned. Oh, okay. actually, let's just take a look at um, answering a couple of these other questions. We got the date and time of the activity. We saw that. We got the IP address of um, Mike's computer, the host name of Mike's computer. We saw that in the DNS activity. Let's just grab the MAC address while we're at it because there it is. Here's the MAC address, uh, the source. 08002BEFAB7C. Uh, and I believe let's 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 go back and look at the uh, we can find the DNS activity to determine it's Mike PC. If you don't believe me, we'll pivot to the logs and take a look at. Here is all of the uh, Windows uh, networking requests being made from Mike's PC out to the broadcast. So it's Mike dash PC is the name of his PC. All right, so thank you again for joining me for today's episode of Zeek in Action. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Zeek, feel free to visit the Zeek webpage and uh, also to uh, join the community, you can go to the Zeek uh, Slack channel 
and uh, interact with all the people on the Zeek team. Thank you for now.